It's thought proper to send my uncle to conduct the material transaction. I met him in Dublin, beginning of March, and um, in which time we let all the lands except Flinteron, on about 40 acres of Vermora, for which we could not get anybody to give the price at which my uncle had valued them. Okay, so we'll just keep going. So basically, for some reason, <coughs> you, you know, we don't have any accounts from uh, his uncle William Tatlow. I mean, this is just an absolute gem that this was even found. It's a miracle. So we're, 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 we're kind of lucky, but <laughs> I didn't even have this. So I'm not complaining by any means. But if we did have that, we might find out when uh, his uncle William Tatlow was actually in employ and learn a little bit more about the details. But who knows? Um, I was accompanied by my uncle as far as Dublin. During his stay, Witherell found himself so much offended by at having nothing to do with letting the lands that he wrote across he wrote cross letters to Dr. Morton and came as far as Virginia and I'll stop for a second here. Virginia is also a place in Ireland. So just not not to confuse that with the Virginia America. To interrupt us, he was taken ill and on his return to Dublin found a letter from Dr. Morton to inform him he had no further occasion for his services. A few days after which he died, he was an honest man but weak irresolute and peevish. So who is this? That is Mr. Weatherall. Weatherall. So we have a death record for a Weatherall. Somewhat. Okay. That's completely outside the scope of what we're doing here. Now, um, when we, uh, when the long witched <coughs> for first of May arrived, we left Belly James Duff, in which we had been heartily tired and went to inhabit a cabin on a farm at Drumrora. The cabin was a bad, bad one and we had very, a lot of inconveniences. And uh, But we had several cows, a horse, a cabbage garden, and were among people with whom we were connected as they were Dr. Morton's tenants and from whom therefore we might expect some civilities. <coughs> we had plenty of oats and potatoes in the ground and etc. Okay. In June the leases arrived from Dr. Morton among which was M Mine of Drumora Lodge, consisting of 78 acres for 28 years. But the doctor was to expend 150 pounds in the building. And uh, at the same time, I received from my uncle the pleasing information that doctor, the doctor had appointed him receiver in the rents, etc., etc. Okay, let's see if I can get some more. These are just very minor details about Dr. Morton's business affairs in Ireland, basically. <coughs> this is still in, in fact the year is 1781 here um, on 10th of October 1781 my daughter Sarah was born and in, November, and in November I was so far recovered as I was able to go to Dublin and make my first remittance to Dr. Morton's banker so I guess he was one of Dr. Morton's um, Renters also. I was accompanied in his journey by Dr. Wilson and his brother John. <coughs> okay. One part of my business in Dublin was, divide, was to advise Mr. Carroll, who was Dr. Morton's law agent, respecting Michael Plunkett, with whom we were likely to have trouble. The, ca the case was this Plunkett held a part of Kilnacroft from Mr. O'Kelly. When I got possession, I sent for him the six months allowed for redemption at. 14 per acre. Anyway, there's just some kind of dispute with the Plunkett. So he's a pretty big landowner up there. Now, how he became in possession of all these lands is, is unknown to me. <coughs> okay, in 1782, uh, his uncle came to visit him, and there was a renovation of this cotton scheme. And on one which he, he went to Mr. Fleming and gave him to understand that if any part of the estate would answer the purpose, Dr. Morton would form a company that would undertake it. Basically just more basic general uh, managing the affairs, and there's far more interesting things in here, but I still <coughs> should just mention these things. And then 
at the general election, this is in 1783, September, September, I voted in cabin by Dr. Morton's desire for Mr. Maxwell. And I had therefore long pointed after some connection which it might not be in Dr. Morton's power to disturb. And this is something to do with, um, it is not to be supposed that satisfied with being the dependent of Dr. Morton, I contented myself with my situation, aspired to do nothing higher. It's John Tyler. <coughs> I was scarcely able to clothe my family and was so much hurt by building and farming that I could hardly make up my account with Dr. Morton. Seventeen eighty five. About this time Dr. Morton wished the lands we had on hand were let, and in, indeed it would have been for his interest and my comfort if they had been at first. Seventeen eighty six. I commonly made a remittance to Dr. Morton's banker to close the first half of the year, about the end of April or beginning of May. Anxiety to make the remittance very large this year induced me to delay it to the seventeenth of May when I sent two hundred and sixty pounds. It happened that before the doctor knew this remittance, my uncle called upon him, found him dissatisfied and peevish. My uncle on the 21st wrote to me to, to desire I would explain things so as to enable him to talk with the doctor, with whose behavior he expressed himself much dis displeased. Okay, here we go. Here's the letter that he, he wrote to his uncle regarding So I guess all the correspondence was going through his uncle, Uncle William Tallow. And this is still 1786. Um, now, basically, the details of this, if I remember um, here, it, it seems as though um, okay, uh, Mr. James Pratt sent to settle accounts with Pat Daniel, who, bearing Daniel's story, <coughs> said the doctor was wrong and he would make him give up the acres which caused the dispute which I had since recovered. To these I may add the pleasure of receiving at least two letters a year teeming with the quote doctor is dissatisfied unquote the doctor is displeased in quotes the doctor is unhappy in quotes I never yet deserved an angry frown deserved an angry frown or word from Dr. Morton. I have done his business with attention, prudence, spirit and, and integrity. These are virtues of a man I value myself for them. Dr. Morton seems to require additional virtues of a additional virtues of a spaniel to bear unmerited reproach with fawning tameness, to the sport of suspicion and jealousy, to lick with the hand of the Christian. Okay. He says, I cannot boast of these. Okay. If the doctor can he says, if the doctor can lay aside his strange fears and not imagine that because of remittance happens to be one, two, or three posts later than common, that is, the state is sunk underground or the world is in an end. If you can do this and have some spark of confidence in me, all is well. If not, recollect yourself. Remember, I am in the prime of you, possession of constitution, which care and temperance. Okay, this is part of a letter that he wrote. <coughs> These were bold words for a man involved in debt and opposed with the prospect of a large family. That's him. But I had no artificial wants, and not being afraid of being able to live my life with honest industry. Michael told the doctor he believed I did not intend to continue in his service, and on the doctor wishing to see it, showed him this letter, which entirely overcame him. He cried like an infant, and the gout, dis the gout disabled him from writing. It made my uncle write me a long letter disclaiming his ever having commissioned O'Reilly or Pratt to do anything, expressing his perfect satisfaction with me in all times, and that if improper world occasioned by pain escaped him, which however he did not recollect, it was cruel of my uncle to take advantage of what was the common consequence of, of the gout. To say no more, <coughs> the whole epistle was the most contemptible stuff I ever read, I have despised him ever since. <laughs> so I'm not sure who he's talking about there. Okay. Um, let's keep going. Okay. Then at one point, 1788, he went down 
to Twickingham to visit uh, Dr. Morton. And now comes the more interesting part that relates to Charles Carr. This I'm just I'm just breezing through this this a very good historical account that everybody should really want to have. I guess I'm going to stop before I go into the next part about Charles Carr so I don't lose this.